Well, it's a pleasure to be here. It's been really fun to meet Avi and the, the folks that he put on my agenda for the day, which um, for the most part are people I haven't met before. So that's really nice. Um, I am at Rutgers University, um, as is Steve, and we are less than an hour away in central New Jersey. We're at the New Brunswick Piscataway campus. Um, and it's been really interesting to learn about this new project that Avi's working on, both of them actually, and I certainly hope that we can contribute some, some ideas to your coordinating center. So um, by way of introduction, I run a very small laboratory of computational genetics at Rutgers. Uh, the work that I've been privileged to be able to do in my career derives from three main interests that I've had for quite a long time. The first of which is computer science, which dates back to when computers looked like that. Um, and that's where I really got my start um, of an interest in science in general. Um, and that's what the internet looked like back in those days, rather different than now. Um, I've long had an interest in genetics, in particular human genetics, statistical genetics, genetics epidemiology, and some of that dates back to college genetics class where we looked at these guys. Um, and then naturally falling out of those two interests would come bioinformatics, of course, and so I just put up a slide of NCBI there as part of the master data set of bioinformatics in the world of genetics. So I've used um, my expertise and interest in all of those areas to focus on mapping the genome in a couple of different ways over time. I've worked on projects that look at mapping genes for specific diseases, and I've worked on a variety of diseases. I've, I've worked for many, many years on just mapping the genome in general. Where are all the markers across the genome? How far apart are they from each other? So I have a set of linkage maps that I've been maintaining for many years. And that's a little, just a little bit of background about me. Um, about eight years ago, um, a friend of mine came across an announcement for funding for a new project that NIH and the NHGRI, the National Human Genome Research Institute, was going to start. And that has evolved into this PAGE project. Um, PAGE stands for Population Architecture Using Genomics and Epidemiology, and you're all going to about to become quite familiar with what we do. I did bring along the co-PI who shares this work with me, Dr. Steve Beiske, uh, who helps me run the coordinating center. And we could not run the center without our awesome program manager, Rashida. So I have to give uh, lots of credit there. Um, and then some students have worked on the project over time. And also, this is uh, a professor in our department who contributes as well. And all of this is from the coordinating center aspect of things. So this is just a little bit of background about the project and what the NIH had in mind. This is one of the kinds of projects where NIH puts out the idea. It's not an investigator-driven concept. Um, so it's a U01 funding mechanism. Um, see if I can use my mouse as a pointer here. I can't see. OK. Um, and so they put out an announcement, an RFA looking to fund four studies initially and a coordinating center to undertake this work. Um, I'm not going to sit and read these, but to summarize, the goal of both phases of PAGE really is to follow up on previously identified associations between SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, and traits. So most of the work we're doing is based on previous findings that have already been published. And those findings were generally identified in European samples or participants of European ancestry. And they were identified by GWAS or other types of association analyses um, on a variety of different sample sets or population groups or participant data sets. So the idea here is for us to work with four existing cohort studies, and I'll tell you more about them in a minute, to see whether these previously published associations hold up and what they look like in different studies, in different population groups, in samples that were collected in different ways, and most notably in samples that um, um, have large subsets of individuals who come from non-European ancestry. So that's really the focus of PAGE. Um, we are now in our second round of funding. We're about a year and a half into PAGE 2, where we still have four studies that we're working with. But one study has changed in between page one and page two. And so that's the addition of Ruth's group here using the IPM BioMe um, repository. 
So I'm going to just run through the whole thing so you understand a little bit about our project. When we were page one, the first round, these were the groups that were involved. Um, does anybody have a pointer? Because the mouse doesn't work so well. I don't really need one. It's OK. Uh, you can Don't go get one. I just sometimes people have one in their bag. Um, so the coordinating center is at Rutgers in New Jersey. And then we, this shows you the four groups that we were working with. One is at UNC. One was at Vanderbilt. Another one is the Women's Health Initiative. And they're at the Clyde Hutchinson Cancer Research Institute in Washington. And then the fourth one is a group out of Hawaii. Um, and then this, is, this was my partner for the coordinating center in page one. And this is a team at the Information Sciences Institute at the University of Southern California. So those were all the players, basically, when we started out. Um, and as Avi is finding out, this type of collaboration brings together people who some of them have never met before. I had never met any of these people before. And all of a sudden, everybody has to play nice and share the sandbox and work together. So that's a bit of a challenge. Um, but we've been very lucky, and, and we really that's worked out fine in our study, I, I, in my opinion. Um, we had to put together logos for everybody. And this is actually the slide that the coordinating center produced to share with all the studies for them to use in their talks whenever they were going to talk about PAGE kind of had to do a little bit of branding of our project. So this was part of that effort. So these were the logos for all the groups in page one. And this slide has been shown at many talks given by many different people in page. Similarly, we put together an acknowledgments document to be used at the end of manuscripts that describe the funding and the various pieces that go into acknowledgments for each of the studies. And we share that with everybody. Uh, Right off the bat, just to show you who some of the folks are, this is a current picture from one of our recent page meetings. Uh, this is probably maybe a fifth of all the people involved in the study, maybe a fourth. Not everybody comes to all the meetings. We meet three times a year in person. Um, these, these are our NIH uh, program officers who help run the study from the NIH point of view. Um, and these are, these are many of the key players in our, in our study. Ruth is in there. <laughs> OK. So you get the idea that it's a big project run with a lot of people, with a lot of input from the NIH as to what we do and what kind of timelines we need to keep and things of that nature. For the coordinating center, I put together, as I said, um, a team of people, some of whom are at Rutgers, some of whom are at the University of Southern California in the Information Sciences Institute. And for the most current phase of PAGE, I've added in a third group of coordinating center collaborators. And they're at Stanford University, Carlos Bustamante and his group. And Emer Kenny, who was formerly with Carlos and is now here, is in your group, Ruth? OK. So that really added a population genomics expertise to our coordinating center, which the second round of phase really called for. And we didn't have that expertise. So you know, we've had to kind of address changing needs over time. That's a key component of at least our coordinating center. Um, at the beginning of PAGE, we all got together and had a meeting to talk about study design and what did we want to do. The NIH had some ideas of what we should do, but exactly how we would do it was largely up to us. So we had a couple meetings talking about what were the first things we would need to do. We had to figure out what phenotypes or traits everybody wanted to analyze, because that was not something that was set by the NIH. They just knew that each of these cohorts that was brought in had already collected um, well-characterized phenotype data on many, many, many different traits, um, hundreds of different phenotypes, obesity-related traits, cardiovascular-related traits, um, what are some others that I'm forgetting, reproductive-related traits, lipids traits, asthma, yep. So your standard collection, really, of common complex genetic disorders. So each of these studies had an interest in one or more of those areas and had already phenotyped large collections of individuals. So that much data already existed. Um, but across the four studies, they didn't all have the same phenotypes, nor were they uh, largely interested in all the same phenotypes. So we had a lot of discussions about what are you interested in, what are you interested in, and what are we interested in all together. And those are going to be the phenotypes we really want to focus on. 
they also had to have discussions about what subset of their um, cohort participants they would want to bring into this study because many of those um, studies or cohorts had very large collections of individuals, many more than could be pulled into the study because we had limited funds. So there were discussions about which samples they would want to bring in, and those were designed so that they could maximize the number of samples for any given phenotype that we may want to analyze. So it kind of goes back and forth. Here's the list of many of the phenotypes that the groups were interested in or had collected already phenotypic variables on. And for each of these types of phenotypes, there could be anywhere from 1 to 20 or 30 different phenotypic measures that were actually collected. So when I say these groups had hundreds to thousands of phenotypic variables, they all come from these categories. Feel free to interrupt if you have questions, of course, at any time. All right, so the initial sample set at the very beginning of, of the work of PAGE looked like this. We had um, a total of around 120,000 samples, I think this roughly adds up to. Uh, the large majority of them early on in our project were of European ancestry, but we did bring in substantial numbers of individuals from other ethnic and racial groups. And the initial plan was to look at about 1,000 SNPs that we handpicked, basically. And this is because there really wasn't any one genotyping chip available at the time that had enough SNPs on it that would really survey the phenotypic uh, phenotypes of interest and the regions that were already known to be associated with those phenotypes. So we pretty much had no choice but to handpick the set of SNPs that we wanted to look at. So we, we did that. That was a lot of work and a lot of coordinating center work went into helping to orchestrate that. Um, we set out to genotype about 1,000 SNPs across 128,000 participants looking at hundreds of phenotypes. And we did that work for about the first two years, during which time we realized a couple of things. Um, which I'm going to get to in a second. That genotyping was done in a distributed fashion. Each of the centers did their own genotyping, and you could debate whether that was a good idea or not, and uh, there are pros and cons. The centers were already set up to do it. The samples were already there, so it was the easiest and the fastest way to get started. But of course, there are downsides to each group doing their own thing. They were on different platforms. Um, as a result, they were genotyping on different strands which I don't know that I really want to get into all the biology of that, but that led to a lot of complications, which I do have a little bit more on later. Um, but they were not prepared to send their samples to some centralized resource, and that was not part of our mandate early on. That has since changed. Um, also, the groups were doing their own uh, statistical analyses, each at their own locations. And there are some good reasons for that. Uh, those groups had already statistical analysts on board. They knew their data very well. They knew their phenotypes very well. And they'd been doing this kind of thing already for many years. So they were already set up to keep doing it. So for the most part, they each did their own analyses, coordinated. Um, we did have discussions about what everybody would do, what kind of parameters they would use, what covariates they might look at, how they would do the analyses. And then the data was combined for meta-analysis. So that was the initial study design, basically. And then we shipped results of these analyses off to the database of genotype and phenotypes, which is where this type of data can, um, can be stored. So we did not have to do that job. And can be disseminated out to other scientists via controlled access. So anybody, any scientist can request access to these data. And as long as you submit an application and say what you're going to do with it and play by the rules, you will get the data but you can't get it directly from us. Um, and the same, so we sent both some aggregated combined data and individual level data, phenotype data and genotype data to DDGAP. Uh, we had to produce this um, chart early on for a paper that we wrote, which describes the structure of our coordinating center. And I was going to show this to you, Avi. I can send you a copy if you want, but your structure may be somewhat similar, or maybe you'll get some ideas from this. But we broke ourselves up into a number of different working groups, which are shown across the top in brown. We had a group for harmonizing the different phenotypes we were looking at, for studying ethnicity and ancestry, and figuring out how we were going to incorporate the different ethnicities that we had into our analysis. Um, we had a statistical analysis committee. We, early on, had that SNP selection committee to figure out those thousand SNPs that were QC. 
We've always had a Publications and Presentations Committee, a P and P committee, which I gather is a standard part of most consortia. Um, they provide guidance and, and organization for publications, presentations, and meetings, abstracts, to sort of help make sure that one group doesn't propose to do the same thing that someone else is already doing. Uh, that's one of the main purposes. Uh, we also early on had a data display working group. To, uh, although we couldn't disseminate this data right out to the public, we did want to help make it readily available to all the scientists within the page. So we worked on some, some visual tools uh, early on. We have an uh, external scientific panel. They're listed here. Are they not here? Actually, I don't think I have them on here. They provide us advice from time to time. Um, we have a steering committee. We had a few more groups doing different things. The investigators are doing their work. Gene typing comes into everybody. The project lighting groups look at the analysis and all the results and write the papers. So here's peer reviewed publications. Here's the visualization tool that we made. Here's data going to the coordinating center through a QC process and off to the um, so that's our organizational structure, which really hasn't changed very much over the years. Even when we started the second round of phase of PAGE, so phase two of PAGE, some of the names of the working groups have changed and some of the specifics of what we're doing, but the overall structure has stayed the same. So it seems to be working pretty well. Uh, and that figure went into a paper that we wrote a couple of years into the project where we, somebody said to me, we need to write a design paper. I said, what is a design paper? They said, that's a paper where you just write about what you're going to do. The structure of your samples, of your, of your project, who you are, what your plans are, why should anybody care about you is basically an advertisement paper, which is not something, a concept I had ever heard of before. But I guess this is something that's commonly done in many, certainly epidemiological type consortia anyway. So uh, we took that on and we wrote that paper. Um, kind of the good thing about that paper is it does get cited by every subsequent page paper. <laughs> On the other hand, when I recently went to look at how the page, I wanted to find out this week how well the page data has been used by others. And that I cannot get a handle on. Because dbGaP, although they of course have records of everybody who's applied for access to the files, they don't keep those records separated out by study in a way that I think is easily accessible. I can email them and ask them if they could pull that out for me, but it's not something I myself can get my hand, hands on. I said, okay, let me go look at citations of our papers. Maybe I'll quickly see that lots of other people are citing our papers. Even seven years into the project, most of the people citing our papers are us, citing our various papers because we have follow-up studies or whatever. Certainly there are plenty of papers that have cited us that have nothing to do with PAGE. And so we know our data is out there, but it's very hard to quantify. So if you can do a better job of that, well, you're handling your dissemination, so. I mean, we need to play a role about changing that and tracking and each data source, and then citation of the study become on a data level and the publication. So that's a big, a big aim. Okay, that sounds great. That sounds like that will help. Um, all right, here's a slide that I only show for a few seconds because you won't be able to read what's on it. But this is what a coordinating center does, or this is what my coordinating center does. So if you want to take that home and study it, you, you know, you'll, you'll get the flavor. But um, I wrote this text for the renewal grant that we wrote to be the coordinating center for page two, which, by the way, was an open competition. That was another RFA. Anybody who wanted to could say, I want to be the page coordinating center and apply, and other people did apply. So I had to sell our coordinating center to continue to be the coordinating center because we wanted to keep doing that work. And so I thought part of what I should write down in my application is everything that we have done because we did a lot. Um, so just to kind of boil that down into some categories, we do a lot of tracking, we run meetings, we handle a lot of logistics for the study. Uh, we developed and maintained the web FTP site and a wiki site that some of us have used. Uh, we track progress of everything that goes on. We run, we book and run meetings. 
and I'm very grateful for Rashida, the program manager, who really handles a lot of that stuff. We run teleconferences and take minutes. Rashida takes minutes. In the course of page one, we had over 600 conference calls with minutes taken and put on the website and distributed to everybody. We wrote protocol documents. We maintain mailing lists for all of the working groups, which did change over time. Um, another kind of area that we work in was the genotyping and QC. So I, we provided some SNP summary and linkage to equilibrium information. This is all data that we pulled from various public, publicly accessible resources and provided our own sort of custom tool to look at some of this data. Um, this is that business of the groups genotyping on different strands, which tied up our time for quite a while. So we mapped the assay data to the reference sequence. We ran BLAST using the flanking sequence of all the SNPs that were genotyped from each of the different groups on the different platforms to identify what strand was genotyped and help coordinate the production of genotype data that would be consistent across all these different platforms. Uh, we created this crazy detailed results QC pipeline. And the reason it was crazy detailed is because we had a German person working on it, as per our earlier discussion, who was really detail-oriented, wanted to get everything right. I mean, he was great, but we had so many steps, and it took quite a long time to put this into place. Doing it again, I think I could see some things I would do differently. But it worked, it worked nicely. Steve got involved in calling genotype data, something he'd never done before. And so the group produced, and Steve called, more than 9.5 billion genotypes. And we did ancestry and relatedness analyses as part of our work. Uh, another category of work that the Coordinating Center does is the data management and dissemination. I already said dissemination mainly means getting it off to dbGaP. So we had SNP assay data that we had to submit to NCBI. That goes to a different database called dbSNP. Um, lots of back and forth with dbGaP so that we could collect data in a way that would be easy for them to work with, and they provided us templates to work with. But at that time, dbGaP was mostly handling data from genome-wide association studies, and Paige was looking at either 1,000 SNPs, or in our later years, we were doing about 190,000 SNPs, which still isn't really a GWAS. So our data didn't really fit into the templates that dbGaP was using, but they were happy to work with us, but we had to develop some revised templates. So that was some back and forth. Stored, shared, tracked all the data files, tracked progress of all the manuscripts um, through about 12 different steps from design, analysis, writing the paper, submitting it to the PMP, reviewing the draft, submitting it to the journal, getting results back, sending it to another journal, the whole thing. Sending all the data files off to dbGaP. OK. This is a summary at the end of page of sort of what we produced. We'd had over 70 people involved at all different levels, which was a lot of fun to get to interact and, and meet all these different people from many, many different universities. Each of these four studies themselves, many of them had pulled in people from other universities as part of their groups. Uh, everyone worked hard to publish lots of papers many of which were page-wide papers. They used data across the four studies, but some of which were papers that were done using the page-generated data, but written up and worked up by just one of the studies. So we have multi-study papers and single-study papers. So here's part of our tracking over time. Uh, this, was in, uh, this was actually quite recent, um, May of 2013. Uh, this is a little bit more recently where you see we're up to 64 papers and fewer of them are in the analysis stage or the draft stage. So it'd be kind of fun to have this as a little motion picture over time. But we didn't really save all that. Uh, we did a lot on data quality control. So I've already alluded to this. Um, here's a little bit more about this issue of strand orientation where for the same SNP, one group might say the genotype is AG, and another group might say the genotype is TC, because they genotyped opposite strands. So um, this was a major endeavor for the Coordinating Center to help coordinate this across studies, identify cases where the groups had done it in the opposite orientation, instruct them, here's what our reference orientation is. You're on the reference orientation. You're not. You need to change your data and resubmit it. 
So there's a lot of back and forth around that aspect. Uh, I already mentioned that we have this QC pipeline. So midway through, we were realizing that many of the associations we were looking at that had originally been found in a European ancestry population were not very strong or were not found at all in other ethnic groups. So many loci did not generalize to non-European American populations, which wasn't really too surprising, but now we were able to quantify this and, and really observe it. Some of this was due to low power in some cases of the analyses. Other reasons for this could be what's called differential tagging. Tag SNP that was chosen for genotyping based upon an, a European ancestry sample doesn't actually tag the phenotype or the locus of interest in another population. So our initial plan to look at 1,000 SNPs wasn't really working very well because many of them just were not powerful in the other sample sets that we were looking at. Around the same time, a new chip came on the market, which was this cardio metabo chip. It's just called metabochip. And this was produced by Illumina. It has 196,000 SNPs on it, which were designed and put onto this chip because they were known to be of interest for metabolic and cardiovascular traits. They previously shown association, or they were in regions of interesting genes. And some group, Voight et al., put together this panel, and they produced this chip. And we became aware of it, and one member of the group spoke up to get us started down this road and said, there's this new chip out, and it's pretty inexpensive. Yeah, it doesn't include SNPs for cancer, which we are interested in. It doesn't include SNPs for reproductive traits. But it has 196,000 SNPs for all these other traits, which you all are interested in. And it only costs $40 per sample to genotype. So a long discussion ensued, and everyone ultimately agreed that we would really get more bang for our buck by changing our study design midstream and switching over to this approach. So we stopped genotyping the 1,000 custom, carefully designed pit SNPs and moved on to using this metabochip. Um, still, everybody did their own genotyping in their own centers, but because they were all genotyping the same chip, Steve, am I correct that we had no more strand orientation problems? That's right. None. I thought there might still be a few, but it really just went away. So that was huge. And it says right there, fewer strand issues. Uh, we did lose our ability to analyze some phenotypes the groups were interested in, but that seemed like a worthwhile trade-off. Uh, you may or may not have seen this paper, which also came out around the same time, basically making the point that I alluded to. Much of the initial work was done in samples of European ancestry or European descent. And this has changed some in the recent years, but very few of the initial studies. Oh, Emer will know this figure, I'm sure. Are you on that paper? Uh, no, no, that was a review. Carla said it's the Bangor chart. Ah, okay. So preliminary results were suggesting that findings from one population may not always translate to others exactly what we were seeing. Many more and larger comparisons are needed, as what this paper had to say, especially looking at Asians, African Americans, and Hispanics, which is exactly what we had among our samples. So along with changing the chip that we were genotyping, or the SNP array, we also stopped looking at European Americans and focused on the other ethnic groups. This would allow us to generalize loci across ethnically diverse samples, help us figure out which samples are population specific, which signals are shared across populations, what is the variability of the genetic effect of any SNP across multiple populations. Um, it allowed us to identify evidence of independent signals within the same locus. Some signals might show stronger in a European sample versus others which actually show a stronger effect than an African-American sample or any other ethnicity. So we would have the opportunity to look at that. And it would help identify the most likely functional variants. So there was a lot of good reasons for us to really change our study design in two important ways. So for the second half of the first page, round of page, uh, we then had 200,000 SNPs on this array, really 196,000. Um, which we were able to genotype in 80,000 participants. So you see now that our sample size had to drop because we still have limited funds. And even though the chip uh, was quite affordable, the amount of money we had left was enough to look at 80,000 participants. And we would be able to 
um, still study all the phenotypes that those SNPs sort of were derived from. So here are some example results from that work. I've got to show one result slide. Um, but this is work of many, many people within PAGE, including Steve. Um, and this came from the first paper where we really described the results from using that metabogen. And here's where I always have to check my notes. So, um, OK, the top figure is from another published paper that had nothing to do with PAGE, Teslovich et al. They looked at 100,000 samples of European descent. Um, the, this is an analysis looking for association with LDL, a lipids trait. Uh, RS629301 on the top right there had the strongest uh, result in their sample. Um, I'll do my best to orient you to what this figure is showing. On the left is an axis, an axis that shows um, statistical association for every SNP that was assayed with this trait. The color of the, so each dot represents association between one of the SNPs on the chip and the trait LDL. Steve, jump in and find us something on here. Or Emer. Or Ruth. The color of the dot indicates LD, linkage disequilibrium, or the amount of association between whatever SNP you're looking at and it's the primary SNP, right? The most global one. The purple one, I'm sorry. Okay, and yeah, that's why it's in purple. So all of the SNPs at the top, you can see they're in they're colored red. They are very closely associated with this RS1274374. Okay. On the bottom you see all these SNPs that didn't show much association. There are some genes in the region that are shown along here. And this bar shows how much recombination there is going on in this region, which is the inverse generally of how much LD there is in the region. Did I forget anything? Just describing what the plot's showing? Okay. So all these SNPs up here that are red are very, very tightly associated with the, this purple SNP that we're interested in. Why are we interested in this purple SNP? When we take the, um, the same region and look at it in African-American samples in PAGE that were genotyped using the metabogen, so now we have a different collection of SNPs. You can see that in this region, we have a much denser collection of SNPs than that paper had. Um, our most highly associated SNP was this 12740374, which is coded in purple here. So in the African American sample, what you take away from this is that all these other SNPs that are nearby, that in European Americans, are just as highly associated with trait as 12740374. In African Americans, because of differences in the LD structure of this region, those SNPs are less associated. And this SNP really stands out from these others, which you can't tease that out when you're looking at European descent samples. Did I get that right? This is not my expertise. OK. So um, this was a pretty exciting finding. And it turns out, actually, that this particular SNP, by follow-up studies done by others, actually is thought to be functional. I think that's been well shown. This is one of the papers that came after. Um, which actually showed that. They established this particular SNP, which would not have been easy to pick out among those from the European sample, creates a transcription binding site that alters expression of SORT1, which I think is this cell SR2 gene. Is that right? Yeah, this particular locus in this region. So that's one of the kinds of findings that could come out of our study, and we had numerous similar findings come out of this metabolism. Um, I, have, I have to wade through another data slide. Uh, now this one is from the same paper. This is looking at HDL, a different lipids trait, uh, around a different gene. Again, African Americans. And the point to be made here is that the top two SNPs that you see associated here, the purple one and the red one that are pointed out, have near zero allele frequency in European American samples. So first of all, those SNPs are not even present on many of the um, popular genotyping arrays that are looked at. And when you do look at them, if you custom genotype them in European Americans, they, they don't turn up to be especially highly associated, something which we're able to tease out because we're looking at a different ethnic group. OK, this is uh, the last data slide, which is showing the same region being tested for association in multiple different ethnic groups. 
So this is, again, for HDL. This is at a different locus. And the top panel is showing what we see in European samples. Um, and there's a particular SNP of interest that is marked in each of these panels. So in Europeans, it's a pretty strong association. In East Asians, it's down here, not very strongly associated. In African Americans, it's again very strongly associated. I think this is the same scale. And when you combine all the data together in this example, that particular SNP, again, really stands out. So just kind of showing you what you see if you look at different ethnic groups. You can find different results like this in all different regions of the genome. In some cases, a SNP will be equally, have an equal effect in all different uh, ethnic groups, and in other cases, the differential is, is quite great. Okay, uh, what were some of the complications we had in our data? And analyses were stratified by self-identified race, which is not the best way to handle that data, so we used principal components ancestry. Um, and in page two, we're able to do an even better job of this. Um, we looked at kinship across all of these samples. Turns out there are people in one study who are actually also in other studies, so that's something that needs to be accounted for. Um, <coughs> we did some genotype imputation, which at the time was pretty cool that we did it in the cloud. That's not so exciting anymore, but, but that was a fun thing that the coordinating center was involved in. So some of the main conclusions of page one were that targeting SNP genotyping has limited value because of this differential effect, um, and that trans-ethnic or multi-ethnic fine mapping would, in fact, be useful for narrowing intervals and identifying good candidates for functional follow-up. And you need big samples, which everybody already knew. So uh, NIH liked what we did. They decided to fund a second round of this type of work, which is page two. Um, all of the groups and others competed, uh, applied for the grant, feels like a competition, to, to be able to be part of uh, page two. And Ruth's group was added into our study. And another group left. Um, we did uh, do well on our grant application and have continued to be the coordinating center. And as I already alluded, we added in a third, uh, third member of our coordinating center, which is from Carlos Bustamante and his group out in Stanford. So we brought a major population genetics component to PAGE, which we really didn't have. And since one of the goals of PAGE 2 is specifically to focus on non-European American samples, and we're really thinking more about other ethnic groups, adding in a population genetics component is very appropriate. Here's our new logo slide. <laughs> So we've got uh, Mount Sinai represented up there. Um, I only have a few slides about page two. Uh, it's very similar to page one. We're basically continuing with many of the same types of analyses, but we're focusing only on non-European descent populations. And we're doing um, X and Y genotyping this time around. We wanted to do sequencing. It would be appropriate to be doing sequencing, but the funds were not there. So the next best thing would be X and Y genotyping. Um, there wasn't an available X and Y genotyping chip that really met our needs, that had enough SNPs on it that were informative across other ethnic groups. So Emer and others um, in the page collection of individuals worked together with another consortia to help design a new chip, um, which we're going to genotype on 50,000 samples. That's the golden number because we get a fixed amount of money and the chip costs a fixed amount of money, so we can afford to genotype about 50,000 samples. Um, we're about a year and a half in, which has mostly been planning and developing this chip and, and figuring out who has what kind of data that they have access to that we may want to pull in and share. Working out our organizational structure, which looks a lot like it did last time. Um, what haven't I said? Oh, here's just a little bit about this new array. Uh, so it has on it tag SNPs that were chosen because they're informative for LD and used for imputation in diverse populations. This is Chris's uh, slide. Um, they will identify exomic content of relevance to multiple populations, which is what we're all about. There was flexibility in designing this chip to allow each of the groups to put on the chip a set of SNPs just because we're interested in them. So would we get 42,000, I think, in the end? Yeah. This is a number that I saw. So those are carried forward from page one, basically, and, and traits that everyone is interested in. It's being produced by Illumina. And this time around, all the genotyping is centralized, being done at one place, 
which is the Center for Inherited Disease Research, which is one of the NIH's genotyping centers. This is a snapshot of what's on the array, another of Chris's slides. Uh, if anybody's interested in these details, we can talk to Emer, actually. <laughs> and here are the main people involved in the coordinating center, and I hope I didn't leave anybody out. Um, and that looks like my last slide, actually. <laughs>